Welcome to Guitar Villains. Why Guitar Villains, you ask? Well, because villains are cooler than heroes. It's just a fact. This is a podcast by guitar players for guitar players, and over the course of this series, we will talk to some of the most innovative and creative guitar players in our community, find out what makes them tick, and understand how we could possibly improve our own guitar playing skills. Thank you for watching the video podcast here on YouTube, and you can also listen to the podcast on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Today's guitar villain is Rick Graham. Rick is easily one of the most humble guitar players on the planet. And you know what that means when the word humble is used to describe a guitarist. That's right, they're an absolute monster player. Rick can play things most people would think is impossible to do on a guitar, and yet his musicality is what stands out most. He's a true maestro and an even better person. And throughout this episode, you'll understand why Rick is one of the most respected guitar players on the planet. In this episode, Guitar Villains. Welcome to Guitar Villains, the show where we deconstruct and decode the guitar. And Rick, it is such a pleasure to see you face to face. It's been far too long, I must say. Oh, it's, uh, well, I, I think this is actually the first time, I've, uh, you know, it's been face to face. Because uh, do you remember the first video, that we, well, <laughs> the video that we did back in 2017, that was all via email. So to yeah. me, this is a, a great honor to... To, to catch up like this is awesome. Yeah, the last uh, time the last time we saw each other, I was giving you a a Skype guitar lesson, and uh, for some reason our right. connection that's our right. connection malfunctioned. I don't know what happened. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Well, to be honest, that's the only reason I'm here. You know, you own me, man. You own me. <laughs> Uh, of course, uh, those of you who don't know, Rick has offered his acting talents and guitar skills in a, a couple of my more comedic videos over the years. And um, all jokes aside, man. It, it is great to talk to you again. You're one of those people. I don't know why we've never like met in person, but I feel like we've been friends for a long time and you know, yeah. I don't mean it to yeah. sound weird or anything, but I just love to catch up oh, with no, you. And no, feel no, like... I, I, get, I have the same feeling, man. It's, it's one of those things that when even, even something as impersonal as email, uh, you just seem to sort of connect, you know, um, uh, and it's it's great, and doing those videos helped kind of to solidify that somewhat. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so uh, you know, for me, it was it was great to be part of those videos, and uh, you know, it's great to be talking to you. And, you know, like it's so cool, man. So we do things a little differently on the show. We're going to play some games. I'm going to try to get to the bottom of what makes you tick as a musician, and hopefully, you'll have a great time. And maybe next time, I'm in the UK. Or you in the States, maybe we can do this again over a pint or something like that. Oh, yeah. Sounds great, man. Great. So uh, the show is called Guitar Villains because I think villains are cooler than heroes. I've always found the the villain characters are deeper and more memorable. Um, so the first thing I want to ask is, out of all the movie or comic book villains or cartoon villains out there, what would you say you identify with the most? And this could be a villain as simple as as you know, you have the similar appearance or a character trait that you share. I know you mentioned Wiley Coyote is your favorite. What, why is Absolutely. that? The reason why is because I, I sort of have some kind of affinity with this individual uh, up to a point because, you know, this character is, is quite an in, insidious individual that is literally just hell bent on, on, you know, uh, catching roadrunner at any cost whatsoever. Because the guy's constantly hungry, man. He's hungry all the time, and he'll do whatever it takes. So I kind of like that, um, uh, you know, the, the fact that he, he he just never gives up, you know. But also the thing that, I, that connects with me with him is he has the worst look in the world. And he's also <laughs> he's also going to fail at every, every juncture. That, you know, every idea that he has, it will fail, but also fail spectacularly. So one of the reasons I love that character is um, uh, just his tenacity, his to be able to just stick with something and never give up, but also the fact that he he just fails every time, you know. 
And, yeah, uh, I see that. You know, I, see. I, I, I do connect with that, you know, somewhat. I see that. I see that now that you explain it that way. And that's why I like this kind of uh, doppelganger comparison because you kind of see yourself in these these kind of deeper characters and you're, you're talking about like striving for for guitar you know performance you could relate it in that way and maybe a lot of other aspects of life yeah yeah absolutely um you know this is absolutely one of the reasons why i love it so much uh and uh, you know i've watched it since i was a kid and you know initially i wasn't really i, I guess i kind of subconsciously was aware of that but you know, it's only when you get later on through life and experience the yeah. trials and tribulations of life that you actually realise the, the, the connection that you have with, with a, a character like that. Yeah. Uh, so I, I still now, it's just one of the funniest cartoons I've ever seen. You know, I love Looney Tunes and, you know, all, the, all of that stuff. You know, i um, a huge movie fan, of course. And, but... Uh, you know, it never fails to amaze me. There's an amazing scene, if you don't mind me um, no, keep expanding going. <laughs> on this. Uh, there's an amazing scene called the catapult scene. And uh, it, Wiley Coyote orders this catapult so that he can catch the roadrunner to kill him and eat him. But every single thing that he does, he builds this, this catapult. And, you know, he starts off by pulling the string and the boulder on it falls on him then the next scene you see and he's standing you know uh you know parallel to it with the string like this he pulls it and it falls that way. so everything that he does it, it just fails miserably and uh you know I, I i do feel sorry for him you know so there's that element of it but it's just it, you know it's so funny as well so so funny well, that is a it. that's a way better answer than I. I was going to compare you to the Marvel supervillain Apocalypse because you're just kind of unfair and uh, how how great you are as a musician. And I know you're <laughs> you're extremely humble, so don't get too uncomfortable when I give you compliments. And maybe just take them, keep them for later, <laughs> because uh, yeah, you're seriously I'll, I will try. you're 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 seriously man uh, a really awesome guitar player, and that's an understatement. But I think. Uh, I think we'll go into we'll go into the next segment since you just knocked that one out of the park. You're Wiley Coyote. That's your that's your villain doppelganger. And yeah, absolutely. Uh, first absolutely. things first, a uh, couple softball lobs for you. Uh, I call this segment "Burning Questions." <laughs> so these are some rapid fire questions, Rick. That if you were to conduct. Okay, okay. If you were to conduct like a live master class or a live stream on YouTube where anyone can ask anything they want regarding music, these are questions I guarantee you they would ask. Instead of asking you about guitar playing secrets and wisdom or anything else that could help them become a better guitar player, they would no doubt spam you with these questions, which in fact <laughs> don't totally matter, but for some reason must be answered. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. What gauge pick do you use? What gauge pick? Dude, I'd never even think about it. Okay. What gauge I'd strings? I'd never even think about it. That's the answer. Then what, what gauge strings? Um, I switch between 9 to 42 and 10 to 46. What is your number one guitar? Uh, uh, I've got to be really quick with this, haven't I? Um, it's a guitar that I've, I've got recently that... Um, I can't really talk about at the moment, so I'll leave it at that. Mm, mysterious. Okay. Yeah. What is your number one amp? Um, amp that I've ever played on was a box, original box AC30. Delightful. Finally, what's your favorite guitar pedal? Guitar pedal. Mm -hmm. Um, probably. Um, I love the Carl Martin Plexitone. I love that pedal. Carmine Plexitone. I don't think I played that one. Carl, Carl Martin Plexitone. Carl Martin, sorry. Yeah, Carl Martin yeah. Plexitone. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the first real question I want to ask you is one that I know you've been asked before. Others have tried to ask you this question, but they haven't asked it the best way, I don't think. So I want yeah. I want a different answer from you from a question you've been asked a lot. 
Um, first of all, I want to acknowledge something I know that you believe, which is that speed on the guitar doesn't matter. And that music is about expression and above all else, conveying yeah. a feeling. Uh, so if you've done that, it doesn't matter how you've done it. It just matters. You've managed to achieve your goal as an artistic yeah. individual with something to share. So the answer to the question I'll ask, if you don't mind, should be as complex and complicated as you can possibly provide. So I want to go deep into the technical side of playing guitar right now. So I want you to get extremely nerdy. Don't accommodate for any skill levels. Just talk off the cuff. I know you don't believe you've mastered the guitar, but you have to admit you're a lot further along than many people will ever be. So what is your long answer to my short question of how do I play the guitar as fast as humanly possible? And I need to answer this in the most complex way. Yes. Um, <laughs> that's, that's a very intriguing uh, question. Um, I think <laughs> it's kind of a you know, strange, strange dichotomy with this thought that I've got in my mind regarding the answer to it. For one, there obviously isn't an answer. Uh, because this this is the way that I think about it, and through my um, experience of playing, is that you know when I initially first started playing, I I did I just got involved in that technical side of playing, and um, you know kind of the, the the position that I'm in now musically is uh, <laughs> if you want to actually be a more you know technical player that plays as fast as you want. Uh, you've got to go back to to creating a, to making sure that your foundation is solid, making sure that you you're actually concentrating on things that you wouldn't even have considered when when you first started playing. Stuff like concentrating on on time feel and rhythm and tone dynamics, touch, you know, finger finger tone, those those kind of things. Uh, when you really dial your ear in, uh, even though you're not concentrating on working on speed per se that would spill over into your general technical musicianship and technical ability. And, uh, you know, that, that, that's the way I think about it. So, so these days, those are the kind of things that I, I work on, especially ear training. I mean, why would you think ear training could affect how you can play technically? But it absolutely does. It really, really does. It changes the way that you approach the instrument. In what way does ear training affect speed? Um, it affects it because you, you, uh, one thing that I've realized is that if I'm concentrating just solely on that one end goal of just speed, I'm kind of missing the whole, the whole world that makes up musicianship and what, what is involved being a musician. So just playing, trying to play fast does not equate to being able to play as fast as possible. That's the way I see it. You know, it's very, you could say it's an objective thing, right? But to me, it's not it's a subjective thing because music is subjective. It's about your, your experience with, with, with learning about music and, and uh, going back to what you're saying about expressing yourself as a musician. Um, I feel that by actually not focusing too much on, you know, on just having tunnel vision with, with playing fast, I think, well, certainly, certainly works for me. If I think less about that objective thing, uh, results come better. You know? uh, that, that's, that's kind of what's worked and for me in the past. Great, great. I like that answer. Now we're going to get to the first little game of Guitar Villains. It's called Name Those Notes. <laughs> So the concept is pretty simple, Rick. I'll play you yeah. a quick sequence of guitar notes from music that you have recorded over the years. Oh, shit. And you have to tell me what song those notes come from or what video those notes come from. In this case, you know, you can name the video or the song. We're going to see how well you know your own catalog and you can recognize your own guitar playing. And it'll spur some conversation about the music too. So, this is frightening. <laughs> everyone says that you'll you'll surprise yourself. Uh, we're gonna start with something easy that I think you'll get, and then things are gonna get progressively harder. Does that sound good? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm ready for it. Yeah. Okay. 
So here is the first noise. Killer shred technique. You nailed it. Very good. This is the first video uh, I ever saw of you on YouTube, and I think maybe a lot of people might say that. Uh, can you explain, are you in an abyss in the depths of the underworld in this video? Where are you? I was. It, I actually changed the title. <laughs> the original title was I was warming up to, to films. At the time, I was working for a company, UK company called Lit Library. Oh, yeah, so yeah. I was having to make some, you know, to record some video DVD stuff. And, you know, I, I just spent a little bit of time warming up beforehand. And uh, one of the guys that works there uh, said, do you want to, you know, just record just a little bit of you warming up, you know, put some lighting behind you. And I was like, yeah, go on then. <laughs> so he, he filmed it. And uh, uh, so that's I, just a I, warm up. Yeah. That's just that's just a noodling around warm up, or yeah, it wasn't. You know, I warmed into it, so I've probably been playing for you know half an hour, so things were flowing nicely, right? And uh, you know, it was okay. And uh, you know, I took it home, and uh, when I actually got it home, the uh, one of the, the audio part was kind of like stuck on the left, and there was a way to change it, uh, but at the time I didn't realize, and I just uploaded it. You know? I so, love yeah. That is that is. Uh, it was originally called "Warming Up at Lit Library," but I, I, I changed it. Killer Shred uh, Technique, way better and I title. Still, I still cringe at the title. <laughs> I love it. No, we all we all look back on our old stuff and cringe, but it's it's yeah. it's what makes us uh, better, you know, as we grow. Yeah, um, I agree. I, and I love about that video how you can hear the pick attack in, in the room. Yeah, because I think a lot of people might be like, "That's fake," and. Uh, you know, that, that's an element of your videos that I appreciate. And, uh, it's just Cheers, awesome. Man. All right. Cheers. So next noise, you got that one. We're going to move on. Here we go. The next group of notes. That's uh, Manhattan there at Johnson Thor. You got it again. Very good. <laughs> very good. Hey, can we talk? Can, can I relay a little story about this? Sure. This sure. Very- that I've always wanted to tell people about this. I did, took me ages to do the Eric Johnson. Again, it was, this was a lit library thing, did a DVD, and, you know, it took me so long because the songs are so difficult, you know, and I had to do every single part, all the backing guitars that you don't listen to, you know, everything in the back. Right. Anyway, I finally finished it, and, uh, you know, I recorded Manhattan, I think, drove home, it took me seven hours to drive home, right? <laughs> so... As soon as I got Jeez. through the front door, went straight up to my, my little studio, set everything up and recorded it. And that's the, that's the, um, uh, the video that's on YouTube. And dude, I was absolutely knackered after, after doing it. Right. Uh, but I just, I always wanted to tell people, man, I was filmed all day, drove for seven hours and then, you know, recorded <laughs> it. I was just so knackered, you know. That's you unreal. Know, I was quite knackered. That that makes it so that makes tired. it seem even more uh, difficult because yeah, as if watching it, was it. it wasn't enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right, <laughs> All right, we got another one here. Capriccio Arabe Taraga. Ah, huh? that's correct. Thank Ta- you, Taraga. So. This is a 13-year-old video. I don't know if you kn- if you know that. Yeah, I, d- I did actually put it up on my uh, a, a throwback video on my Instagram. Oh, right, okay. Uh, uh, and uh, it's actually listed as being, I think it was 2007, as being uploaded. That's right. But the actual fact, when I put it up, I realized I recorded it in 2005. So it's like a, a video that was recorded about uh, two two and a half years prior to, to, to 2007. Jeez. I mean, when people think of you, I think some people might think of really cool guitar playing, like shred, whatever you want to say, flashy. But when I think of you, I actually, I love the classical guitar playing. And I think it's so interesting, the kind of two sides of the coin that I find with guitar players who are so technically proficient um, who can play on this classical side, but also on the, you know, shred metal side. Like Ingve is a good yeah. example of that, um, and and you yeah. are are just such a a great player in that way. Is that something that 
came did did classical come first or was that uh oh, something no, afterwards? It, um I, uh, I'm an electric player, you know, that, that's where my roots are. Right. Um, so I just went through different phases and, uh, you know, started to get into the technical stuff. Because when I first started, I was into uh, to, to pop songs and, you know, electronic music and well, loads of different stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. But anyway, I got discovered Satriani. My brother showed me Flying in a Blue Dream. And I was just like, wow, that's incredible. Yeah. So that's when I... Um, those were the, were the first days of me being a recluse, basically. <laughs> I, I get <laughs> that feeling. I know. Myself away. Uh, but I got to a certain point, and, you know, I started to get interested in jazz and finger style and stuff like that. And uh, then I got into classical guitar and ended up going to a, a, a classical um, a, a conservatoire music school in London mm-hmm. to study classical guitar because I'm so obsessed with it. I actually thought I might become a concert classical guitarist, but... Wow. Uh, I'm going to uh, ask you about music school a little bit later. Um, yeah. I got two more sounds for you, okay? So here's okay. here's the next one. See if you can identify this. <laughs> WTF was that? <laughs> Uh, that has to be the WTF lick. Is it the WTF lick or is it something else with a different title? Maybe part of a series. Ah, uh, uh, hang on. If you'd like, I can give you an extended version. Uh, yeah, go on then. Go okay, on. here's the extended version. I apologize. It's pick like the wind. No problem. You, I, that's I was, the I was, one that was in 2013, 14. Yeah. Time. Yeah. That, that's one of my favorite series that, that has ever existed. Rick's quick, but slick <laughs> licks Dude, to, to make the guy, to make the guys um, go <laughs> and to make the girls go. <laughs> Dude, I'm not joking. Just a quick aside here. Yes. I still get messages from people saying, uh, you know, it's so offensive, that <laughs> intro. You know, when are you going to remove it? It's one of the best <laughs> intros. Don't ever change it. <laughs> no, no. It's seriously, oh, it's so great. I, I uh, and, and you chose Jack Black, which is just the perfect uh, yeah. for, for that face <laughs> and, and a, a lovely lady. I don't know who she is. <laughs> for the moaning oh, that's just a random you know yeah. the, the cat and black thing always made me laugh you know? yeah. <laughs> it's seriously if, if anyone's not familiar check out uh just go on youtube type in rick's quick but slick licks and the whole series of insane guitar licks and uh that hilarious intro <laughs> um one of one of your uh finest pieces of work i have to say <laughs> all right so you, final final sound here okay and Here we go. This is the hardest one. I'm only going to give you one note. That's Time by Satriani. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. You only need one note sometimes. Man, uh, so... I I noticed that you reshared like a remix of that recently. Yeah, and Joe um, Joe commented on it. Yeah, absolutely. That's got to be amazing because I know what a huge fan I'm a huge fan of Satriani as well. Um, yeah, man. And yeah, st- you know it's you know it's cool. Steve Vai commented on a video that I made recently on his joint shifting technique, and I was like, Yeah, Whoa. I saw it. I saw it. And, yeah, man. And so it's... you got a comment from Joe Satriani, and these are like our guitar heroes. So what what was that going through your mind when you when you got to read well, I that? Was just like, well, I I woke. <laughs> Uh, I don't know whether it was in the middle of the night, just like couldn't sleep. Was, uh, uh, you know, sometimes I uh, suffer from insomnia from time to time. And yeah. uh, woke up just like, oh, let me, have, let me check it out. And then there it was. It was like, <laughs> what, this is, no, this has got to be a fake account. He said, got- he said, great playing, Rick. I don't think I've ever heard anyone cover this song of mine. You've elevated it in many ways. I'm honored. 
Oh, it's incredible. Um, well, actually, what happened was um, the guy who did the backing, Sasha, who was just a brilliant musician, um, he uh, he said, oh, Joe Satriani's producers just commented on my Facebook post, you know. Mm. Like, wow, John Cunaberti, who, who has worked with Joe, you know, over the years. And John Cunaberti commented on the video. And I was like, oh, wow, that's amazing. That's <laughs> Satriani's producer. And then Satch posts, and I'm just like, oh, I know how this has worked. He's, he's, he's literally sent in the video. So, yeah. dude, I was just like, oh, that's so cool to have somebody that's inspired you over the years. You know, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now without having been inspired by his music and his playing. So yep. it doesn't matter, you know, what happens in life. When something like that happens, you're just like, wow, that's incredible. Yeah, so, it's, it's really uh, rewarding and, and uh, validating. Absolutely, it really is, and it just makes you think. Uh, you know, just this is what it's all about: is inspiring other people and continuing that virtuous circle of inspiration. And that's what that's what being a musician is all about. Man. Today's episode of Guitar Villains is brought to you by Guitar Super System. Are you tired of YouTube ads telling you that YouTube guitar lessons suck? Me too. I don't know about you, but somebody setting an acoustic guitar on fire or teaching crappy cover songs in front of a musty black curtain feels a little disingenuous to me. I'll get straight to the point. Join tens of thousands of other guitar players and visit guitarsupersystem.com to join the most popular independent guitar learning platform on the internet. If you're a beginner, there's an entire curriculum called the Beginner's Corner just for you. If you're an expert, the music theory and technique curriculums reach the highest levels of mastery and are based on industry standard learning methods I've used since graduating Berklee College of Music. If you're somewhere in the middle, you're actually the perfect candidate. The choose your destiny approach allows you to cater your learning experience to exactly what you want to accomplish, whether that's improving your improvising, ear training, learning new techniques, songwriting, and more. You'll also have access to private live streams, lesson comments, and a community forum for feedback, as well as exclusive giveaways and new curriculum releases. The best part is everything that I just mentioned is included in one monthly subscription and you can cancel anytime or, like a lot of people do, upgrade your subscription to a yearly pass. Of course, you can also just learn guitar right on YouTube for free because YouTube guitar lessons don't suck if you know where to look. So check out guitarsupersystem.com. Now, back to Guitar Villains. Speaking of guitar pe people who play the guitar who are unbelievable, you became an unbelievable guitar player. I'm saying that. You don't have to admit it. Uh, there had to be some sort of edge to achieve what you have. Like I, I have this feeling, and you wouldn't know it by talking to you, but I feel like you're kind of competitive. And like there has to be something that drives you to become so proficient at so many styles. Like you said, you went through phases of electric and then classical. It takes some people their entire lives to get good at one, but you did both. And um, it, is yeah. there a competitive edge to you? Definitely. There's no question about it. Um, but I think it's really more, you know, over the years I've realized it's more about, you know, um, I'm going to sound really old now, but um, <laughs> it's more about me. Uh, and competing with myself, you know, right. can I push myself hard enough to to overcome these situations and problem solve and use use some modicum of intelligence to to you know um, uh, because no 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 problem is insurmountable. Um, so uh, that's the way that I've always seen it. So I'm, I'm more competitive with myself. However, I will still say when I see somebody that's incredible, I'm just like, God damn. <laughs> that's really good you know so it gets yeah. it gets not in a negative way but in a really positive way and I, I love that I think it's really important to have uh, something where you're just constantly pushing yourself all the time um, but you've got, you've got to remember every single human being we have limitations so you know uh, it's important not to, to let those overshadow what your strengths are yeah I find that that feeling exists in me too and especially with YouTube, you know, I see my peers doing things. I'm like, whoa, I could never make something like that. And then it pushes me. And I also had that experience when I went to music school. I mm. was surrounded by people who were better than me, as we all are yeah. when we go to a place like that. And maybe they think you're better than them. And, and it's all this kind of strange uh, environment. But uh, what was your experience like at you said a classical conservatory. Like, what was your music school ex experience? Can you describe um, a fond memory from school that sticks uh, out to you? Well, I never 
<coughs> I'd never seen um, musicians like it, you know. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it was one of those things that, because I went to see, before I went to the, to the music school, I went to see the final, you know, um, final concerts, you know, of the, the, the musicians graduating, the guitarists. Right, right. And uh, I remember seeing one particular guy, uh, and it, I was just like, oh, this is, it's hard because you're just like, Will I ever be that good? You know, this guy was absolutely astounding. You know what he was playing, um, and just the level of musicianship was just incredible. So, uh, but th- it was great. You know, it put me in, in positions that made me feel very, very uncomfortable. But I, I really had to. You know, it was a real test of, you know, whether I could actually, you know, stick with it and, and you know, try not to, to give up on it and just. Keep pushing, keep pushing. Yeah, it's amazing how discomfort can spawn some of our greatest actions and feats. And Dude, I find I best. find myself putting myself in places of discomfort in order to go on. Isn't that a weird thing that we do to ourselves? <laughs> it's it's a wonderful thing, you know. Um, and this is not just to music; it's to, to anything. And it's to you know, this is really to do with you know any sense of adversity in life. Um, you know, I think whenever you, you're faced with any kind of adversity, that's when you can really, really open your game and do stuff that you never even thought you'd be capable of doing. And, you know, this is across the board with anything, yeah. you know, not just music, but I, I think, you know, dealing with adversity and, and, and moving forward, in, you know, in a positive way, uh, is, is a, a wonderfully powerful thing. I think, uh, a burning example in my mind is when I was in Asheville, North Carolina. I had graduated from music school. I tried to make it with a band. It didn't work out. Everybody broke out. I was getting married and working in a golf pro shop, uh, making like no money. And I was just like, I had all this music inside me and I'm like, what am I doing? What am I going to do? I just felt like I didn't belong right there. And yeah, did you ever have like a job before music became your primary? Oh, oh yeah. Like, Plenty do you jobs. remember that feeling? I feel like it's right there behind me. Well, dude, I, I, I had plenty of jobs. Uh, I had jobs before, um, I left school. So this was before I became a guitar player. Mm-hmm. You know? Uh, experimented with different instruments prior to the guitar, but, um, you know, I had jobs uh, while I was at school. Then I uh, worked in a, um, this factory for two weeks. I always used to get sacked after a week or two <laughs> because I, I'd go in with headphones on. I'd be sitting there listening to music, and yeah. you can't you can't do that if you're going to focus <laughs> on. Some, so I just I just got sacked from every every job. That is so funny. <laughs> so uh, you know, I was really lucky because uh, you know I did have a number of you know real sort of you know menial jobs. Um, uh, that, that really would I realized, man, this is destroying my soul. This mm-hmm. is not what I want to do. But I was lucky because I, you know, at the time, you know, I was living with my dad, and he was, you know, he was dealing with paying the bills and everything else. So I had all the time to to, to practice, you know. And uh, yeah. some people do not have that, you know, um, luxury to be able to do that. And it's very tough for a lot of people. You know, totally. so I was, really, you know, really lucky. Uh, but then, you know, I did that for a, a few years, and I started teaching. So I realised, oh, you know, I can share this, you know, my thoughts with everybody, but also make some money and try and try and build it up at the same time. So that's kind of what I did. Yeah, you're um, you're an educator, uh, and I just want to say, man, I've taken a lot of inspiration from your teaching methods over the years. I, oh, awesome. I was wondering, what what do you think makes a great teacher? Mm, good question. Good question. I think it's um, one thing is the ability to, to be open minded. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's got to be sort of some sense of putting yourself in somebody else's shoes, trying to understand how their, or, you know, what their mindset is with, with playing. You know, because it's all very well if you understand it and you get frustrated when somebody else doesn't understand you. So what I realized is that I, I had to stop thinking about myself from my own perspective and try and view it from their perspective. Because that helped me to understand their mindset 
And I learned so much from doing that. Um, so, so over the years, that's, that's what I've tried to do is, is realize that everybody's perception is not necessarily the same. And the and, interesting uh, thing too, is that as a, as an educator and as someone, especially in your position, you've probably been in their shoes before. So it's not even sympathy, it's empathy where you can actually empathy, yeah. r- realize exactly how they're feeling. And it's, it's and kind empathy. Of, that's what it is. Yeah. What it is, dude. That is empathy has been one of the biggest life lessons, you know, for me. Uh, and uh, you know, as I go through life, I'm trying to just allow it to, you know, permeate who I am. You know, um, because when I was younger, I didn't. I did get it up to a, up to a point, but I, I think, you know, it takes takes a lot of time, a lot of experience to really understand these things. Totally. And uh, you know, just going back to adversity, all the, all of those things. That's what can really help bring that out and you know if you think of all the musicians all the wonderful musicians i guarantee you there's, there's always some some kind of element of, of adversity you know on varying varying degrees and uh, it's a huge part of, of self-development as a musician and a, as a human being in my opinion totally agree and i think as a as a teacher at least for myself and it's probably true for you I never stop learning. I love to learn. And yeah. I, I was wondering, what's something that you've learned most recently? Something that I've learned. Uh, oh, really great thing that I'd, I'd, I'd never really done before uh, is um, playing scales, um, seven note scales or even eight note scales with two, only two notes on a string. So it's a limitation exercise. Wow. And um, this actually comes from, I've been watching a lot of uh, uh, videos on uh, uh, Mick Goodrick. Do you know Mick Goodrick? Oh, yeah. I have one of his uh, uh, jazz theory books. (laughs) Brilliant. I got that book as well, but I was watching some videos and uh, just seeing his approach and, uh, you know, watching some other players do it. I was just like, man, this is wonderful. Because what I'm trying to do now is, is instead of using... Um, you know, muscle memory in order to negotiate my way through a scale or an arpeggio. Mm-hmm. What I'm trying to do is concentrate on using my ear to guide me rather than the muscle memory. And, that, you know, that's, that's difficult because you end up losing a lot of your... Well, not losing it, but what happens is that the technique falls by the wayside because you don't... It's, you can't do it at the same time. So when you're concentrating on using your ear, say, you know, you play a... a a scale, whatever, whatever scale it is, You've, and you're limited with just two notes on every string. We're playing it linearly, so right. not re- not repeating any any notes. That is tough, man. And if you do it with you know major scale, all the modes, um, you know minor scales like harmonic minor, melodic minor, and all the modes of those scales, and stuff like the uh, diminished scale, you know the eight note scale. Uh-huh. Um, uh, which actually turns out to be a little bit easier than some of the others. You know, when you're doing the, of the finger position uh, or it's that modes, it's, it's, yeah, it's, um, because it's symmetrical. So it seems to be a lot easier, but again, it's, um, you've got to tread with caution there because the more you practice it, the more it becomes muscle memory. Mm. So what I always try and do is not practice these things too much and just rely on my ear and whether I've in, you know, because this is a huge indicator of whether I've internalized the sound of a mode or a scale. If I can hear it first, uh, uh, you know, I, I can certainly play it, you know. Oh, yeah. And that's that's an old trope for guitar playing that goes yeah. back to the very beginnings, you know. Oh, it does. Developing it does your matter. ear. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's the thing that I do more than anything else is, is the, the ear training. Um. And uh, a lot of it is to do with actual listening rather than sitting down and going, right, I'm going to work out exactly what this is. So a yeah. lot of it is just, like, can I instantly recognize what this progression is? So, you know, I listen to a lot of music, you know, for that, mm-hmm. but also, you know, uh, listen to it for enjoyment. You know, you know what's interesting about that two-note thing that you mentioned? So two notes per string. I've actually used that method to simplify scales to relate them to people who are learning 
beyond, say, the minor pentatonic scale, because the minor pentatonic scale traditionally is two notes per string, and everybody can kind of get it down. It's nice and comfortable ergonomically. So when I introduce some players, again, empathizing with where they're at, if they're just not getting maybe a three-note per string situation or, or the shifting of a fret here and there, I introduce scales as two note per string and I just pick the most interesting interval per string and yeah. it can be a way to basically Jedi mind trick the uh, student yeah. into feeling like they're maybe playing something like the minor pentatonic scale but they're actually getting these very interesting colors that they haven't but played that's before it. that's it and, you know it's very this is where you know when you concentrate this is you know, what I was talking about, you know, concentrating on technique too much, you can miss out all of the heavenly glory of, of music. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> the heavenly uh, glory. You, know, you, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, there, yeah, is, of course. You know, uh, just by doing something, uh, approaching it in that way, makes you realize that it's very easy to become, you know, to have tunnel vision with technique and, and, and concentrating on just you know one objective, which is to play as fast as possible, you know um, yep. all the rest of it. And I've got no problem with that. With you know, I've got no problem with what anybody wants to do. But uh, you know, there is so much more to to, to developing as a musician and, and things like that. It, I think they're they're wonderful. So, what you do know? you think? Uh, what do you think is the hardest thing about the guitar, and what's the easiest thing about the guitar? The hardest thing about it is, um, <laughs> oh man, the hardest thing about it is just, it's, I find it extremely difficult with everything that I do on the guitar. So every single thing that I'm, I'm there's always some, something around the corner that I think, yeah, I think I've got this down now. And then I realize, oh no, no, I haven't. I need to work on this more. You know, so yeah. it's constantly, it's constantly reminding me, dude, when, you know, when you sit back and go, no, nah, I'm not too bad. You need to remind yourself, no, man, you're nowhere near, nowhere near. And it's every time I look at my guitar, when it's just sitting there quietly, I know it's just sending me a little message saying, yeah, man. <laughs> it's still my so, house. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so, uh, and the easiest thing on guitar um, if, well, again, if, you know, there isn't, it's just too diff- it's, a, it's such a, a difficult instrument to negotiate. Um, but it's such a, a beautiful instrument as well. Um, and you know, hence the challenge, you know? Yeah. The easiest thing to do is just pick it up and play it. Yeah. I think that's a, yeah, that's a great thing. Just, yeah, not concentrate. Excellent. Not concentrate too much on, on all of those, those pressures that we put on ourselves and just, yeah, just play it. Just yeah, just do it. I got a couple uh couple cool questions here, I think. What's your favorite airplane album? If you were to fly on an airplane, what would you listen to? What I was gonna say then was uh, airplane, never heard of that band. <laughs> uh, if I was on an airplane, um uh, what do I listen to when I I always listen. I always go back to listen to the same stuff all the time. Uh, I have this habit of just repeating stuff, uh, but it depends what it is. Depends what kind of mood I'm in. Um, Let's say you know, you're flying I'm, over, flying overseas. You're coming here to Nashville, Tennessee. You're going to hang out with your old pal Tyler. Go to the honky tonks, drink some beer, eat some hot chicken. What would you <laughs> listen to on the flight over the ocean? Oh. I was going to say uh, Crash by the Primitives (laughs) Hopefully it doesn't come to fruition (laughs) That's right right. That was a joke of course Uh, I don't know Just some some damn good rock stuff You know Nice I tell you what I'm listening to is uh, Big Wreck So I'd probably uh, Do you know Ian Thornley from Big Wreck? I don't know what that is Oh, dude, you gotta check Big Wreck out. Absolutely incredible stuff. They released an album uh, Big recently. Wreck? And it's like du- Big Wreck. W R E C K? 
Big yeah. Wreck. B-I-G-W-R-E-C-K. That's Absolute a- brilliant rock stuff. And dude, I would probably slam that on to, to get me pumped for, for coming to meet you. So it's Crash and Big Wreck. I, what are you trying to say here? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I should let you come see me. <laughs> That's right. Maybe I should come over by. Yeah, but. yeah. Maybe I'll come to you, man. <laughs> <laughs> <It's awesome. laughs> oh man. Okay. Well, we got we got some music to check out. Thanks a lot. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, <laughs> another question for you. I call this build a band. Uh, what four others? including yourself. So five people all together. What four others in a band living or dead would you want to play with? Assemble your band. Okay. So first off on keys, I would have uh, Jan Hammer. Jan Hammer. Yeah. Um, uh, Who would I have on drums? Who would I have on drums? (laughs) <laughs> I don't know whether to make a joke. <laughs> um, who would I have on drums? Uh, don't worry, you won't hurt anyone's feelings. No, no. Uh, so Jan Hammer on keyboards. Um, I'm probably going to, you know, with stuff like this, I always forget you know, because of, you know, being put on the spot, it's just like, why did I say that? Yeah, yeah. Um, Who's, who but, are you thinking uh, of right now? Who I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of um, somebody like Phil Collins from Genesis. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, there's loads of other players. Oh, yeah, yeah. Who would I have on bass? Um, just a tight bass player. Um... Victor Wharton, maybe, I think. Good choice. Yeah. And uh, what else have I got? Another guitar player? Whatever you want. It could be a harp player. Yeah. um, (laughs) I would love to to, um, have... I would love to jam with J.S. Bach just to know what went on in his head (laughs) and how he approached stuff. That's an amazing band. Yeah, pretty mental. <laughs> pretty mental. Uh, so, yeah, it'd be interesting, intriguing to see what the results would be. Indeed. So, Rick, uh, as we wind down here, uh, I want to thank you for being on Guitar Villains today. It's been a blast to, uh, uh, to talk amazing. to you. I want to really enjoy it every second. Yeah, thanks, man. I, I, I want to loop in your guitar supervillain alter ego. So, I have one. Uh, one final question for you. What do sure. you believe about guitar that most guitar players would think is crazy? And this could be a hard truth guitar players need to hear or something you know that others don't. Maybe a misconception about the instrument or whatever you want. What What do you believe about the guitar or guitar playing that others might not? Uh... Well, I find I find playing the instrument a very sort of meditative thing, and uh, I think you know when you're just sitting in the zone and you're you're really focused on on what it is that you you're wanting to achieve. So there's kind of some kind of um, I'm not saying it's a like spiritual thing, but you know for me that's. That's how I like to, uh, that's kind of like the direction I'm going in. Um, so, you know, I think it's such a mysterious instrument. Uh, I think it's important to just open your mind to as many different things as possible uh, with the guitar because it's just an endless journey of, of discovery. And, uh, you know, discovery about the instrument, but also at the same time, self-discovery. Discovery about yourself and who, who you are. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful advice, man. Um, that's where we'll leave it. It's been an honor and a privilege to talk to you today. Uh, it's been we'll, 
we'll but look forward. Uh, <laughs> we'll look forward to seeing what treacherous plots you devise next in your musical yes. endeavors. We shall see. We shall see.